Welcome to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on high-performance computing. Today, my guest is from the Transaction Processing Performance Council, better known as TPC for you benchmark folks. And our guest today is Michael Puss. He's the uh, former chair of the TCPH committee and a number of other things. So, Michael, welcome to the show today. Thank you very much, Rich. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming on. You know, we're here to talk about uh, benchmarking, the future of benchmarking. And um, I brought your slides up if if you want to start with that. Great. So uh, today's session is about the future of benchmarking. I will present three novel concepts presented at the Transaction Processing Performance Council. If you go to slide number two, a brief overview of the agenda. I'll give a a quick background on the TPC, its mission and background, and then I'll go over the the background of the TPC-TC before I dive into the main portion of uh, today's presentation, which is about three papers that were presented at TPC-TC 2011. And I will conclude my talk with a um, call for papers for the next TPC-TC conference Uh, which will be held in 2012, next year. Slide number three. The mission and background of the TPC is to disseminate objective, verifiable performance data to the industry. It's a nonprofit organization established in 1988. We have currently three benchmarks, uh, two OLTP benchmarks, TPCC and TPCE and one decision support benchmark, TPCH. And we have a couple of benchmarks in the pipeline, so uh, watch out for um, new to come from, uh, from the TPC. TPC-TC is TPC's series of technology conferences. It was established in 2009 because the TPC felt that it needed to keep pace with technological changes and it wanted to solicitate input from not just the member companies, but from the industry as a whole and from academia. And we know all that technological changes occur and they occur at a faster pace. Their the system are changing. There, there are now uh, large memory systems, um, cl- uh, clusters of thousands of nodes. There are SSDs, all technologies that need to be tested for performance. And that's why the TPC established uh, TPC TC in 2009. And it's basically a forum for industry experts, TPC members, and academic people to come together to present and debate novel ideas. And as we have seen in the past, it also fosters collaboration between the database research community and industry experts, which is very fruitful for the TPC. And the TPC tries to take the ideas that were presented and include them in either in existing benchmarks or, or to spark new benchmark developments. And, and this is uh, where I'm going to in, in a couple of minutes. Just uh, to give you a little bit of history of of what happened at previous conferences, Uh, we had the first conference in 2009, and I am now on slate five. The first conference, we had a paper about virtualization, which resulted in um, the starting of benchmark development within the TPC. We had a paper about dependability benchmarks which sparked collaboration between TPC members and um, academia. We also had a paper on on ETL, which sparked collaboration between the the, the TPC and HP Labs, um, which directly funneled into uh, the ongoing uh, development of an ETL benchmark within the TPC. Similarly, 2010 was a great success because we we had um, a paper about a generic data generator, which is being used in the development of uh, TPC ETL, and is also um, considered in in another benchmark like TPCH. We had 
uh, another paper about dependability, which funneled ideas also into a paper um, about um, TPC, extending availability aspect into TPCE. And we had a position paper about uh, TPC energy. So which brings me to 2011 on slide six, we have the list of papers that were presented. Uh, we had um, one keynote paper and we had one invited talk. The rest were all uh, papers from either industry experts or um, academia reviewed by a team of 12 reviewers. I wanna go into the details of three of those papers. One is extending TPCE measurement avail in availability in database systems. The second one is about metrics for measuring the performance of a uh, mixed workload. And the third one is introducing SKU into TPCH benchmarks. I'll start with the first one, which is about extending TPCE to measure availability in database systems. TPC is a great benchmark. It uh, it's a successor of TPCC, and it's the latest in a series of OLTP benchmarks. Started with TPCA in, in 1989, and it simulates the OLTP operations of a brokerage firm. And I'm on slide eight now. The the figure shows um, what is what is measured, um, what what portion of a brokerage form is measured in TPCE, and as, as good as TPCE is, it does not measure currently how a system, the system performance behaves if the system malfunctions, like during a power failure or a, a memory failure that causes um, the entire system or a portion of the system to go down. And this triggered Yan Tao Lee and Charles Levine from Microsoft to propose extensions to TPCE for measuring the availability of, of such a system. And by the way, no industry standard benchmarks currently addresses this aspect because it's very difficult to do. How do you, um, first of all, how do you measure it? How do you define it so that it's fair? And secondly, how is it being measured in context of performance? The high availability system that uh, Yan Tao and Charles assume have a principal server, have one or more standby servers that provide service in case a system fails. Uh, I forgot this again, but I'm on slide nine. The, it, it also includes a management component that monitors the system and decides which server is uh, the principal server. And fourth portion is a connectivity component that directs database connections to the current principal server. And the main metric that they're gonna use, I'm going to a little bit more into details, is the mean time to recovery. Because usually high availability includes mean time between failures and mean time to recovery. However, mean time between failures requires a lot of assumptions. How often do components fail? And, and because of all these assumptions, they decided to ignore that and say, okay, components fail, systems fail, let's concentrate on the mean time to recovery. And I'm now on slide 10. And this is just a, a picture of the, the system and how they modified um, the, their TPCE benchmark kit to enable um, fault injections and, and recovery. The blue portion is basically standard TPCE drivers for the different transactions. The green is the SUP with the connectivity components management component and two servers, one the principal, one the standby. And on the right side, we have the fault simulator that basically injects a fault and causes the system to, uh, the, the principal server to fail and um, to, to fail over to the standby.
Wi-Fi server. Slide 11. Now, their approach is uh, to run the workload for two hours, and at a random time, after the workload is in steady state, initiate a, a, a failure and causing the system to fail over from the principal to the standby server, which of course will become the principal server at that time. And then 10 minutes of downtime, the principal server started again. And after another 30 minutes of execution, uh, the transactions are switched back from the principal to the, um, sorry, from the uh, current server to the principal server. And as I said, as I said, the the, uh, they focus on the mean time to recovery. The service downtime is basically the elapsed time from when the first client loses a connection to the resumption of transaction, uh, uh, transactions after reconnection. And the time to steady state, which is a little tricky, is computed as follows. So assuming that we run for uh, so for each s so uh, sorry I'm a little confusing here the the this this pertains to both a regular run without failure and a run with failure assuming that for each se second s the performance throughput can be measured as ts then for any duration of n seconds starting at s seconds one can calculate the mean m and standard deviation for this interval um, S to N. And this is done for the entire interval of a run without fault. Then for a fault run, M and D are calculated for a 60 second interval starting at the time S. The system is up following a fault. And the system is considered to be in a steady state at the first point S such that the ratio of the faulty system, so DS for the 60 second divided by uh, M is less than alpha times that of a system without failure. So this um, is, is very technical, but we have a white paper that goes into m more details uh, of, of the benchmark and how all this is, is computed. I would like to continue with the um, second paper. It's about introducing SKU into the TPCH benchmark, and I'm now on slide 14. Um, this paper was presented by Alain Crolotte and Amat Gazal from Teradata. Alain is a uh, also person with the TPC. has been around for for uh, almost 20 years, and they're extending TPCH, which is the TPC's current decision support benchmark. I don't want to go through in, into the very details of H. I just want to point out that the, that it uses a third normal form. And all the data in H is uniformly distributed. And, and the LAN and AMAT are trying to fix that. And the, the problem is, uh, what, what this means basically is that each nation has the same number of customers. Uh, each supplier supplies the same number of parts. Apart from this being not very realistic, it also imposes little challenges on today's system. Statistic gathering is very simple. One only needs to sample a very small portion of the data and then extrapolate that for the full data set. Data placement into partitions, indexes is, is very straightforward. Interconnectivity is not um, an issue here because um, if the data can be so easily partitioned, if it's uniformly distributed, um, there is very little interconnectivity uh, interconnect traffic between uh, clusters, for instance. And also, query optimizer um, of the database is not very well tested because uh, SKU tests corner cases, and, and since there is no SKU, there are no corner cases. So, um, uh, Alain and, and Ahmad uh, changed dbgen and qgen uh, to introduce SKU. The big problem of introducing SKU is that it potentially creates a non-reproducible stimulus to the system under test, meaning that if company A runs the benchmark and goes against a, a portion of the data that 
that has very few rows. So again, for instance, uh, picking a supplier that has uh, only supplies few parts that is unfair um, against somebody running the benchmark that picks a supplier with a high number of parts. So what they introduced is uh, comparability zones, and I'm on slide 15 now. They divided the data set into comparability zones. I'm just giving an example here with two zones, um, basically saying um, nations like France, uh, Iran, and Algeria have a few number of customers versus some other like Mozambique has, has a lot of customers. And this is a controlled skew. It's known by the data generator, of course, and by the query generator. I'm going to slide 16 now. So if, if the query generator knows about this, and if we take the current set of 22 queries and clone those queries, whereas one set goes against a one comparability zone and the other set goes against another comparability zone, we again have a very fair benchmark because everybody runs queries against comparability zone one and comparability zone two. In addition, the queries, the clones, they look identical to the system. So the system doesn't know looking at a query with a particular substitution parameter that this query goes against comparability zone one or two. So this is the challenge to the system. And of course, the data distribution imposes challenges to partitioning and, and to connectivity traffic and so on. Okay, now I'm on slide 18, and this is about the third paper that I'm going to talk about, which is metrics for measuring the performance of a mixed workload. This work was done by a research group at the University of Munich, together with some industry experts, uh, some from the TPC. And they are trying to solve a, a very important problem that exists right now. Traditionally, the approach to business intelligent, intelligence includes an OLTP system and a BI system, separate systems that are periodically refreshed, um, or the, the business intelligence system is periodically refreshed by an ETL process from the OLTP system, usually at night. But people are moving the, the, in, the refresh interval uh, closer uh, so that the business intelligence system is, is, is up to speed of what's happening in the OLTP system. So there are good reasons for this approach. The, the OLTP and BI workloads are very different, and people can use specialized hardware and software uh, to, uh, to build these systems. The OLTP system is not disrupted by BI queries, and the systems can be tuned individually. But there are also obvious disadvantages, the ETL process needs to be developed and maintained. The refresh interval causes data delay, even if we go down to, to hours or minutes, um, there is still a delay. And multiple systems need to be purchased and maintained. And recently, um, people have made the case for real-time business intelligence. That is a system that is running both OLTP and BI workloads against the same physical system and the same database. And the advantages are um, very obvious. Uh, there's one system, one database, and no refresh interval. Data is current. Problem is that the database system, uh, the system in general need to handle both the, the OLPP side uh, very efficiently. There shouldn't be any disruptions against the operational side. And analytical queries also need to be um, executed and and uh, perform sufficiently. So companies are starting to build these systems and that creates a void in, 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 in the benchmark community because there are no benchmarks that test these kind of systems. And by the way, this is, this is um, different than virtualization. With virtualization, you have 
different applications running on the same server. This is really one database, one system running two workloads. And the TPC is very well positioned to create such a benchmark because of its existing suites of benchmarks. Uh, we have TPC, two, two OLTP benchmarks, C and E, as I mentioned, and we have TPCH as a decision support benchmark. And the University of Munich, they were in need of, of such a benchmark, and they looked at, at TPC's benchmark, and they, they found, oh, TPCC and TPCH are very similar in terms of their schema design and that the model they, they, they um, the business they model. So they both, both, model a retailer or, or a large distributor, and the, the schemas are very, very similar. So they took the TPCC and TPCH schema and combined them and built, and I'm on, on page, uh, on slide 20, they combined the two into what they call a CH benchmark schema. Of course, they had to make some adjustments. They had to add a couple of tables, change a couple of tables. But in essence, this is a merged, the CH benchmark schema is a merged schema of C and H. Now on, on slide 21, uh, I want to go a little bit into the, the specifics of the workload and, and the scaling. So since, since the, the schemas are very similar, and actually what they did is they took the C schema and accommodated the H schema. So they changed the, the H portion a little bit. So they were able to run the same transactions as in TPCC, the same mixture of read-only and update-intensive um, transactions they have in C, the order, payment, order status, delivery, and stock level. And they run all 22 TPCH queries, some slightly modified to fit the new schema, but the semantics of the query and the syntactic syntactical structure are preserved. The data scaling of C and H are quite different. C uses a continuous scaling model versus H uses fixed scale factors. This, this was a small problem, but they um, got around it by, by basically saying, oh, let's use fixed scale factors. And the scale factors is uh, the number of warehouses, so based on the number of warehouses, uh, like in C, um, but again, it's a fixed scale factor so that um, the, the TPCH queries can run um, well. And un unlike TPCC, there is no sleep time or keying time, and this allows for higher throughput on smaller systems. And this is not really something that, that is super important um, if um, this is just something they did because they wanted to test this on smaller systems. And I'm now on, line, on slide 22. The metric they proposed in their benchmark is actually uh, consists of four portions, and um, some of them are for the transactional side, and some of them are for the um, decision support side. Um, so as in TPCC, they have a transactional throughput. TP, in TPCC, this is called TPMC, and here it's called TPCM, very similar to how the throughput is measured in, in TPCC, so I don't want to go into the details. Then they have a geometric query mean. So for each of the query, they, um, they measure the average response time uh, completed during the measurement interval and determine the geometric mean of each of the queries. Then in uh, the third portion is a dura duration per query set. And this is just the sum of the average response times of all queries. And this is reported similarly to TPCH as query per hour CH. And then total completed queries per hour. And again, this, this is something they came up with. Um, if the TPC decides to move forward with such a benchmark, this is all subject to change. But this is a very good start because they provided the schema, they provided uh, the, the modified DB gen, they provided uh, the modified uh, query generator. So this is a very good start for the TPC to work on a um, mixed workload benchmark. And then I'm coming to my last slide, 24, which is a call for participation 
uh, PPC PPCTC 2012. Invitation to help to mold future benchmarks. PPCTC 2012 will be held in conjunction with VLDB in Istanbul, Turkey at the end of August, uh, August 27 to the 31st. And industry experts and academia is invited to participate, submit novel ideas and methodologies in performance evaluation. As you have seen, these ideas make it into the TPC, make it into uh, future benchmarks. And it's very exciting to be part of this um, benchmark community to mold future benchmarks. Um, or you're encouraged to contact myself, um, michael.pess at oracle.com, Raghu Nambiar, R Nambiar at cisco.com, or Nicholas Vaku, he's the R chair of the TPC at Vaku at Dell.com. All the details are on slide 24 of the slide deck. Thank you very much. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Well, thank you for that, uh, Michael. You know, I, I'm curious about what drives these kinds of changes at this level for TPC Council, right? So I don't want you to generalize, like it's, it's always uh, vendors complaining or customers, but uh, if, in particular, these three uh, changes, what, what, what was the origin of the, of the change? So I think this is coming from a multiple sides. Uh, it's, it's basically vendors developing systems based on customer needs. And then they look at these systems and say, what do we need to showcase performance of these systems? And, and that's what drives TPC members to then write a paper for TPC TC, like, like in the case of Alan. He has been with the TPC for a long time and he, I assume, I mean, I can't talk for Teradata, but they probably have a good engine to deal with SKU and, and they want to showcase that. And then, you know, he, he writes a paper to TPC TC and, and that gets picked up by the TPC. And say, yeah, that's a good idea. That's, that's good for customers. So, uh, Michael, you know, I worked at uh, I worked at Sun Microsystems for ten years, and the benchmark guys were always down the hall from me, and they would always complain that some of these TPC benchmarks got to be a contest of who had the most money to throw at a particular benchmark and set up, you know, huge machine setups to to run the thing for extended times. Has, has that situation changed, or you think that wasn't a fair description? I think this is a fair description. If you look at TTCC benchmarks, they have become very expensive. And some of that has changed um, recently because of the technology changes. Um, like uh, TPCC benchmarks used to be super, I mean, they are I.O. demanding and they're very expensive because of the disk farm they require. But with technologies like SSDs, that has changed a little bit. Uh, but they're still very expensive benchmarks. And to some degree, that was uh, was addressed by the TPC with, with other benchmarks like TPC-E. And um, similarly, in TPC-H, those benchmarks also tended to be very disk-heavy, spindle-heavy, so they were very expensive. But that also has changed somehow uh, with, with SSDs and with, with memory being very cheap. So uh, some, some, in some respect, this has been addressed by the TPC, and in some respect, this has been addressed by, by technology, by, by, by companies um, developing newer, better, faster, cheaper systems. So, Michael, you know, since those days, the world has changed a lot. It seems like the enterprise is running a lot of these kinds of um, jobs in virtualized environments, right? Um, how does the TPC Council deal with that? So, the TPC is currently developing a virtualization benchmark, TPCV, which I don't know, I'm not up to date on, on the schedule for this. But the TPC is addressing this, and 
hopefully there will be a benchmark pretty soon that that people can run to to test large systems, complicated systems in a virtualized environment. Great. So so Michael, we've got we've got the three white papers and you know certainly they're available for download. Um, but but what's the call to action? What would you like uh, the industry to do with this information now that you've put it out there? I think the 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 white paper that we put out there is a a brief overview of what is coming, so the industry can prepare um, for for these things to 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 be happening. Um, there is no need for people developing their own benchmarks if if the needs that they have are going to be covered by upcoming benchmarks. Um, I, I think that's the big big advantage. And I just also wanted to add that the the very detailed papers will be available through through a publisher named uh, Springer, and they're going to be available through their LMCS, Lecture Notes in Computer Science series. So if somebody really wants to dive into the super details of not just these three three papers, but all the 14 um, papers, they, they can do that through the, the LMCS by, by Springer. Okay. Well, kind of a wrap-up question here, Michael. Uh, um you know, we, we, we've seen a lot of technologies, but it seems to me like SSDs and flash memory have really spiked performance in certain areas. H have you seen that kind of a, a dog leg in uh, TPC numbers? Uh, yes, especially with, with, with memory becoming very affordable. Uh, people have built very large in memory databases um, and this is, is most apparent in in TPC age if you go to the website um, with the uh, benchmark um, publication website of the TPC at uh, www.tpc.org you can see that the most recent benchmarks have uh, numbers that that are I don't know them offhand but I think they were like five to eight times higher than previous numbers, and that is mostly based on uh, clustering large number of systems and keeping the data in memory. Well, it's 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 really interesting to follow this stuff uh, as it evolves. And um, Michael Puss, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. You bet. Okay, folks, that's it for the Rich Report. Stay tuned for more news and information on high-performance computing.